Hi TIE Fighters, Ken's uh, Skype connection dropped him midway through and we couldn't get him back, so we don't hear much from Ken this episode. I left him in the introduction because he helped us a lot um, planning the show and stuff, and it's too bad that we don't get to hear very much from him. Next time, Ken. Next time. Okay, uh, without further ado, enjoy. Oh, hello old friend. It's good to see you. Let's talk about this word... Fascination. It describes an unquenchable urge which compels our hearts to quest and be captivated. As long as there are elegant explanations to complicated phenomena, science will never lose its romance. Over the years, I've traveled the world indulging in my fascination in physics, and now, I find that a new hunger has woken within me. A fiery need to share these great ideas with the people around me. And so, I have assembled a team of some of the greatest, most lucid, most creative minds I've encountered in my travels. And I call them my Titanium Physicists. You are listening to the Titanium Physicists Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, Allez, physique! Why is the sky blue? I can't think of a more fundamental question, and in my life I've heard lots of different explanations, and most of them are wrong. So, it's not dust in the atmosphere, and it's not blue for the same reason that my shirt is blue or that water is blue, and it's not blue because it's reflecting the color of the ocean down on us. It doesn't even really have anything to do with the chemical composition of the atmosphere at all. It's something else, something wonderful. So today we're going to answer the question, why is the sky blue? So obviously, this question is the type of question a child would ask a parent, along with, why is expensive peanut butter really oily? Or, why does the water in fire hydrants not freeze in the winter? These are all good questions, but why is the sky blue is the one we're talking about today. And recently I received an email from a guy by the name of Steve Van Breda. Recently, my 10-year-old son asked me the common question, why is the sky blue? And I found myself struggling to explain it in a way that he might understand. Would you be able to explain this to him with your usual awesomeness? And if you feel so inclined, would you be able to do it orally on some site like SoundCloud? My son would think you were just the coolest guy if I could get a response of that magnitude from you. So in response to his letter, no, Steve, I don't know how to work SoundCloud. Do you expect me to learn how to use some crazy new website just to answer your kid's question? Obviously not. So, allow me to introduce today's guest. It's Steve Van Breda and his son, Ruben. Hey, Steve. Hey, Ben. Hey, Ruben. Hey. So, Steve has five kids, and Ruben is the oldest. He's a 10-year-old, and he's pretty much the coolest person we've ever met. He's into Pokemon, and when he grows up, he's going to be a cartoonist. So, Steve, Ruben, for you today, I've assembled two of my most powerful titanium physicists. Arise, Dr. Ken Clark. Whoosh. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, wait. It's Dr. Ken. Dr. Ken did his undergraduate at the University of Toronto, and then his master's and PhD at Queen's University, and now he's at Penn State working on Ice Cube. Now arise, Dr. Amanda Bauer. Cube! Dr. Amanda is a super science fellow at the Australian Astronomical Observatory. She's an expert on how galaxies form and change, and she is one of the world's leading astronomy bloggers. Her blog is at amandabauer.blogspot.com, and there'll be a link to it in the show notes, or you can just Google AstroPixie to read about what's new in astronomy and what's fantastic to know about. All right, guys, so why is the sky blue? We know that we've got daytime when the sun shines on Earth. And sunlight is actually 
a combination of all the colors in the rainbow. When you add all those colors up, then sunlight is actually white. But things happen to that white light as it travels. If light just travels on its own and doesn't hit anything, then it just travels right in a straight line. But the light from our sun actually hits our atmosphere as it shines down on us. And things happen to it as it hits the atmosphere. Now, I've often heard that it hits dust or molecules in, in the atmosphere and something happens to it. Exactly right. Okay. So there's gases in the atmosphere and particles. Um, mostly this is nitrogen and oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, but it doesn't actually matter what it is. It's the interaction between that light. So light has energy. Um, it's got an electromagnetic field, and these particles in our atmosphere also have electromagnetic fields. So it's this complicated reaction between all of these electromagnetics that causes the light to change its path. Now, these particles cause the light that comes in to change its direction. That's the main effect that it has. And different kinds of light, so the different colors of the light, change their direction in different ways because they have different wavelengths. So you can think of light as it travels as a wave, as you would see a wave on top of water. You've got the crest, the peak at the top, and then you've got a dip, and then that pattern goes back and forth. And the distance between a crest and the next crest, those two peaks, that is what we call a wavelength, the length of the wave. So when you have white light, you get all combinations of all kinds of wavelengths added together. And when you see that white light split into a rainbow, you've seen light shine through a prism, and you can see it split up into its rainbow. Those colors, that blue, that green, that red, those represent different lengths of the wavelength. I've heard that red is the one that goes the farthest. Red is definitely the longest wavelength. So why is the sky red? Exactly. So We're getting there. Question. That is an excellent question. <laughs> so... Blue light has the shortest wavelength. And because the particles in the atmosphere are the size they are, they happen to bump the blue light, they scatter the blue light, they change the direction of the blue light more than the red light. So it's more likely that this blue light that comes through our atmosphere gets shaken up a bit more and gets scattered off in all directions more than the red light. And so you're exactly right. The red light more often gets through the atmosphere and travels to us, and that blue light gets all scattered and bounced off in all directions. And since all the particles in the atmosphere are all bouncing all the blue light around, we see the sky as that blue scattered light. So is that kind of why um, the sky is kind of like red when the sun's setting, when the sun's rising? Yeah. So as the sun starts to set, it goes off towards the horizon, and as you're looking at the horizon, you're actually looking through more and more and more atmosphere. When the sun's straight up, then you've only got a couple miles worth of atmosphere up there. But as you start going over to the side, you look through more and more and more atmosphere, up to 10 times more, so 10 miles of atmosphere. So you've got more particles there that are able to scatter the light from the sun. So the blue light gets scattered away and then starts scattering some of the green light. And then you scatter all of those colors. So the only thing that's really left is the orange and the red. So at the sunset, all that gets through is the orange and red. And that's why we see red sunsets. Okay, I have a question here that maybe you're going to address later on. But when I learned about the rainbow and the, the colors splitting in grapes, you learn about Roy G. Biv. You know, red, yep. orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Aren't those the ones that the, the the color indigo and violet, aren't they at the end of the color spectrum? And wouldn't they have a shorter wavelength than blue? Excellent question. That's absolutely right. So what you've described, the rainbow, is the visible spectrum. So that's what our eyes are sensitive to seeing, human eyes. Mm -hmm. Other animals can see other kinds of light. If you go to much shorter wavelength, it's called the ultraviolet. So Roy G. Biv ends in violet, and then the yep. ultraviolet is a little bit shorter. That actually starts to get absorbed by the atmosphere, and our eyes are not sensitive to that. So then you start to get into the violet and indigo and blue, and it turns out that you're right. The violet and indigo do get scattered even more than the blue light, but our eyes are not very sensitive to that violet and that indigo light, not as sensitive as we are to blue light. Mm -hmm. And also the sun produces a certain amount of blue and red and ultraviolet light. 
and it produces a lot more blue light than it does indigo and violet. Really? So there's a lot less of that light to get scattered, and our eyes are not as sensitive to that light. All right, Reuben, how much did you get of that? Um, see, see, see if you can explain it back in your own words. Yeah, yeah, do your best. So the sun, like, hits the atmosphere, and it's kind of like it just scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, so that's kind of why the sky is blue. Right? Exactly. I've got a I've got a bad metaphor. Would you like to hear it? Sure. Okay. So uh, you know how if you um, you mix colors, you get different colors, right? If you mix yellow and blue, you get green. If you mix all the different colors together in the right way, you get white. Uh, so I like to think of it in terms of like a stream. So have you ever watched those nature documentaries where there's like a bear that's like batting salmon out of the water? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's like that. So there's a whole bunch of different colored salmon. So there are some purple salmon and some blue salmon and some red salmon and some orange salmon, right? And the bears really like the salmon that are bluish and purplish colored. So at the very bottom of the stream, when the when the salmon first enter the stream, the bears along the stream start whacking, knocking out, and eating the salmons on it. But they're, they're trying to pick out and knock off the salmons that are bluer and purpler. So the, blue, the purple ones go first, and then they knock around a whole bunch of blue ones until all that's left are crappy yellow and red salmon. And so, in essence, uh, you know, if we're standing next to the stream, all we end up seeing is a whole bunch of blue salmons because those are the ones that the bears are knocking out the stream at us. So in the evening, when we, you can look at directly at the sun-ish, you can't never look at the sun. Anyway, <laughs> in the evening, uh, ben, what are you saying to my son? All the salmons that are left in the stream after the bears have had their go are just these orangey yellow salmon, and that's why the sky is orangey yellow at night. I think it's a really good metaphor. Thank you. <laughs> Incidentally, we we've been saying this word scatter, and scatter is an interesting word. All it means is. There is some structure, and then the, the organization goes away, right? So when you go into your room, and you, you take all your toys, and you can scatter them around the room. So it kind of means, like, going in all, like, different directions. Yeah, that's right. And the deal is that there's a whole bunch of different ways, there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms to scatter the light. So, for instance, the, the reason that my shirt is blue is because the light that comes and hits it, only blue light gets scattered off my shirt. So whenever we talk about colors, we're going to use the word scatter. But what happens in the upper atmosphere is a really special type of scattering. It's called Rayleigh scattering. It's named after a, an old British guy. Rayleigh. And the deal is that it, all light is a type of wave. You've played with magnets before, right? Have you ever played with static electricity? Uh-huh. With oh. my hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, right. I've got a mini Van de Graaff generator wand. Oh, that, man. <laughs> Dude, oh, I, I've got nice. so many fun science toys. It's awesome. That's fun. So, so the deal is that there's a connection between magnets and the static electricity. And it's fairly complicated, but the deal is that... If you move static charges around really fast, or if you move magnets around really fast, you end up making these waves, these electromagnetic waves, they're called. And we have another word for electromagnetic waves, and that's light. So somewhere in the sun, you have charged particles that are moving around really fast. And those waves are what we perceive as, as light. Okay? So it's kind of like a wave on the ocean. You guys live in Ontario, right? Yep. Yeah. It's kind of like a wave on Lake Ontario. Uh, Lake Huron, dude. It's kind of like a wave on Lake Huron. Huron. <laughs> Huron. <laughs> it's kind of like a wave on Lake Huron. So I, I want you to imagine like a boat, okay? So imagine this really calm day and you have a boat sitting out on Lake Huron. Now imagine that you had a really big hand, so like you, you were the Hulk or something. And you could reach out and grab the boat and push it down and shake it. It makes waves, right? So as you move the boat up and down, waves will get radiated out. And now I want you to imagine Lake Huron on a pretty windy day, okay? So the, there's already big waves in the lake. Really big waves. Waves that are, you know, big enough to move the boat. You just said it was really calm. Yeah, no, <laughs> tomorrow. So today it's calm, and I move the boat up and down, and I make waves, right? Yeah. So tomorrow I come back, and it's a windy day. Okay. And it's so windy that there are big waves, 
And so now the waves are moving the boat up and down. Mm-hmm. So the big wave comes in. As it lifts up the boat, the boat goes up in the air. And as the wave, the trough of the wave moves in, the, the boat goes down. So as the boat's bobbing up and down, it's still going to be making waves. You dig it? Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of at the heart of Rayleigh scattering. What's happening is these electromagnetic waves are coming in and moving through the atmosphere. And as they move through the atmosphere, they move near particles in the upper atmosphere and they cause the particles to jiggle. We can talk about this a little bit more in in more detail a little bit later, but they cause the particles to jiggle. And when the particles jiggle, they end up emitting light, their own light. And the shorter the wavelength the waves are that hit, the, the faster it'll make these particles jiggle. And the faster the particles jiggle, the more light they're going to emit. Has the light already broken into separate parts at this point? It's kind of like the stream full of salmon. Yeah. So the bears, in this case, are the jiggling particles. When uh, a purple salmon moves past the bear, it'll, it'll swat the salmon out of the stream. So this is the the particles jiggling in response to the wave moving past it is in effect the sorting mechanism. It's how all of the different colors end up being sorted by the by the particles in the sky. You're you're saying though that that the sky itself becomes a bit of a source of light. That's right. That's awesome. Well, you think about it. So if the sun is over on the horizon, it's morning, so it's over in the eastern horizon. There's still light coming from straight up in the sky, even though there's no star that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And the light that we see from the atmosphere in the middle of the day is all just light that has been sorted and knocked aside by particles in the upper atmosphere. So that light wasn't, it wasn't moving straight from the sun to us. It was glancing through the atmosphere. But then this atmosphere did this sorting thing and knocked some blue light, blue colored light down our way. Okay, so this this actually is really interesting to me because I always thought, and I think a lot of people are probably with me, is that the the sun goes through and it, and it breaks up up into colors, and f- for some reason or other, the the blue part of that spectrum gets bounced around and d- gets diffused through the dust or gases of the atmosphere, and that's what kind of that's where we see the the blueness of the sky. But what you're saying is that the sky itself is, is emitting light, and this blue light is is kind of um, like a, an incidental part of the sun shining on the atmosphere? Yeah, that's pretty much it. So the sun comes in, and it's got these energy waves, and they react with the gases in the atmosphere. So it could be any kind of gases up there. Anything that that starlight would interact with would cause this rally scattering. So it excites or it bumps around these particles. And because the size of these particles relative to the wave that's coming in also determines the fact that it scatters the blue light more. So if those particles get bigger and bigger, then it stops scattering the blue preferentially and it starts scattering all the light just the same. So it's because these particles and these gases happen to be the size that they are that they cause this sensitivity in their scattering the blue light more. Now, I want to ask if you have noticed what color the clouds are. White. White. Do you have any idea why they might be white? Because, like, water, and it kind of, like, sort of, like, the sun's going on it and turning it, like, kind of, like, boiling, so it just evaporates. And then, so so when it comes up, kind of like the light, but um, it just turns all white instead of the greenish or blue up in the water. It just purifies, kind of. So you're exactly right about these particles in clouds being mostly water. And water particles are bigger than just the nitrogen or hydrogen gases that are in our air. And so because those particles are bigger, they don't scatter blue light more sensitively than they scatter the red light. So they just scatter all the light. And when we add up all that scattered light, it looks white. So it's because the clouds are made of water and that those big particles scatter all the light the same... So we see all that as as white light. That's why the clouds are white. So there's another interesting thing that happens in our sky, and I don't know if you've noticed it before, but if you look straight up during the day, you notice that the sky is actually much bluer than when you look down towards the horizon. The closer and closer you get to the horizon, it actually gets lighter and almost close to white. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. So do you have any guesses as to why that might be? Um... 
Probably because, like, part, more, more particles or something like that. The sun's kind of overhead. That light that goes towards the horizon has to go through more and more and more of the atmosphere. So more and more light is getting scattered. So the blue scattering out and then the green and then oranges and reds even start to get scattered. So the sky's not completely blue because you do have a, this mixture of lots of different scattered light and the light coming from the sun that's white that doesn't happen to get scattered. So as you go down towards the horizon, more and more and more light gets scattered. So in addition to the blue, you start adding in also the green and the yellow and some of the orange. And so when you start adding more and more light together, you get closer and closer to white. So it's just the blue that gets scattered straight above because it, you're going through thinner atmosphere. And as you go through more and more and more atmosphere, everything starts to get scattered. So that adds up to be white. But instead of getting lighter and lighter blue, why wouldn't it change to different colors until it got to white. Because you still have all of that blue. It's just in addition to the blue, you start to get some yellow and some orange and some green as well. Okay. Okay, yeah, of course, because the the blue is not being subtracted, so therefore it's still a shade of that blue. Yep. It's the blue plus, plus more stuff. Okay, so, Ruben, do you want to know about the colors of skies on other planets? I've, I've kind of really been wondering the colors of skies and different planets. So I've read some science fiction books where they describe the sky as being green, which would be kind of an interesting thing to see. But as far as I can tell, there's not an easy way to make that really happen. So have you seen some of the images that the Curiosity rover or the Pathfinder rover or some of the other Mars rovers have sent back? No. Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. You have pictures of Mars from the rovers. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. I asked my question Sorry. in a confusing way, I guess. <laughs> it's okay. It's funny. I'm not a bad dad. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to dad jail. I know. <laughs> so they call Mars the red planet. And it looks to me in some of those images like the sky there is kind of maybe yellow or butterscotch or orange or red. Do you see some of those colors in those photos? Yeah. And I think what happens, any time there's an atmosphere, there are gases in the atmosphere, and the starlight comes through that, you're going to get Rayleigh scattering, as we described before, which is going to make the sky blue. So that will happen no matter what, as long as there's an atmosphere. So you're saying no matter what is in that atmosphere... Yeah, as long as some sky. sort of a blue sky. Yep, it's going to tend to scatter that light towards blue. Can can we sense a, a like a blue wavelength coming from a planet? So yes and no. I'll okay. give you some answers. <laughs> <laughs> so the other issue is that if you've got anything else in the atmosphere in addition to those gases, then that will start to change the color away from blue. Okay. So fundamentally, you might have this blue sky, but if you've also got dust, which Mars is pretty famous for its dust storms, or you've got other things like aerosols, then that starts to absorb light, and it also starts to give different colors to the sky. So what we think from these photos from the rovers is that the Martian atmosphere is a bit thinner than ours, and it starts to look very pink because of the high dust content. Now, a big challenge with knowing what the color of a sky on a distant planet is, is actually the limitation of what our cameras are on the rover. So the camera on the rover has certain filters. When it sends its photos back to Earth, we can add them together to get our color images. But it's very, very difficult to know whether or not those images are actually what our eyes would be sensitive to. So this is one complication in fine-tuning exactly what the color of the Martian sky is. I've seen some images they've taken of the sunset. So as the sunset gets down towards the horizon, most of the sky looks pink because of this dust that's in the atmosphere. But the actual sunset on Mars looks a little bit blue. And that's because the dust starts to absorb all the blue light. It doesn't actually scatter it in the same way that our atmosphere does. It absorbs the blue light, which takes it away, which makes the sky generally look pink. 
But then when you go through all of that atmosphere, when the sun gets way down in the horizon, it does start to scatter some of the blue light again. And so the Martian sunset looks kind of blue, or it looks a lot lighter than what ours does. It's almost the mm-hmm. opposite of what Earth's sunset is. Yeah, I remember seeing pictures of it. It looks almost silvery, especially with maybe you know, that's the red around surrounding it. But yeah. kind of hazy and silvery, and maybe a touch of blue, too. Now, can you imagine what the what the sky would look like on a planet that had absolutely no atmosphere? Black. To, exactly. So that sunlight is just going to keep on traveling as it is until something gets in its way. And if there's no atmosphere to get in its way, then we'll just see that pinpoint of the sun and the rest of the sky will look, will look completely black. So Mercury is an example of a planet in our solar system that doesn't have an atmosphere. So its sky looks black. Cool. Okay, so Ruben... It doesn't sound like it's very possible to get a sky that isn't blue. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the question. What if we had a planet that was around a different star? So did you know that stars are different colors? Yes. Good. So some stars are red, some stars are bluer. The, the color of the star kind of depends on how big and heavy it is and also how young it is. It depends on its temperature. Yeah. Sorry. And that's because of all those other things. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Okay, so we were saying before that the color white is made up of all the different colors combined, right? Yeah. But it's made up of all those different colors combined in a really specific ratio. So you've played with paints before, right? You ever mix red paint with white? Yeah, it turns pink. Yeah, that's right. If you change the ratios, if you end up with a different color that's not white. So if you have light coming from a different colored star, where that star isn't white colored, maybe it's blue, maybe it's red and it hits the atmosphere of a planet, the Rayleigh scattering will cause the sky to maybe be a different color. Maybe it'll be a reddish color or a more violet color. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Awesome. Is there a limit as to what colors that a sky could be then? Well, really, it depends on what eyes you're looking (laughs) So your human eyes can see that the rainbow, the Roy G. Biv that you described before from red to violet, So we would be able to see any of those. We're most sensitive to blue. So if there's blue sky, then that's most likely what we would see. Would would there be a sun that could hit an atmosphere that we could conceivably stand on in whatever sort of spacesuit that would give us a green sky? Now, green is interesting. If you've looked at the stars and you've noticed red and blue and white and yellow stars you don't actually see green stars. And that doesn't have to do with the temperatures of the stars. That has to do with the fact that our eyes are the least sensitive in that space. There's three little response curves for our eyes. And the the one that peaks at the blue side is really sensitive. And then there's like the green one and the red one. But I think there's a spot between the blue and the green where we're not really that sensitive. Okay. Which is why we don't see... Green stars. Do green stars exist? Temperature-wise, they do. There's a whole range of temperatures of stars that, in principle, include green. It's our eyes that are interpreting it, and we're not sensitive to be able to see it. So we interpret it as a different color? Yeah, we would be sensitive to the other colors that the the star gives off. It's just that, that green we're not receiving. Okay. Well, we're not interpreting, I guess. It, it hits our eye, but our eye isn't is sensitive to it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was really um, a, an interesting thing when I first realized that there aren't any green stars. My guess is that it would be very hard with our human eyes to be able to see a green sky just because the way our eyes receive light. We don't have a high sensitivity to green. We very easily see a blue sky, obviously, and we would start to see more orange or red. So do you think it's like possible that... Say, somehow, we managed to get an animal, like, on a planet, and it would see a different sky than we do? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think if we were creatures that evolved on a different planet with a different sun, then it's likely that our eyes would evolve to have a different kind of sensitivity. So maybe our eyes, for some reason, would be more sensitive to green than they are to blue, like our human eyes. And that's what started that first interstellar war, was an argument over what color the sky was. 
<laughs> it's amazing how difficult it is to quantify colors. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine so. It, it's a very gets into the subjective how I see the world versus anyone else. Well, I think there's two different sides. There's the, the physicists, which what produces the light and how is the light changed? And then mm-hmm. the physiological side, how do we interpret that? How do ours receive it? And of yeah. course, 10% of the male population doesn't have that red receptor or is colorblind. So they would see things as shades of gray and not as distinct colors. We could talk more about uh, the craziness of Raleigh scattering because there's an additional detail that we haven't told you about. How would you like to go about it? Um, well, Ruben, do you want to hear more about this? Yeah, sure. I think it's really interesting. All right. Okay. <laughs> Here you go, guys. <laughs> okay. Let me... T- so... So what I'm about to tell you is a little bit bananas and kind of tricky to understand. So you just tell me if uh, if if I'm going too fast for you, okay, Ruben? Okay. It has to do with how light is a wave. But light's a really special wave. Um, it has something called a polarization. Um, so have you ever gone to a 3D movie? Yes. Right. And you get these sunglasses, right? Mm-hmm. Except you can't get, except you can't leave them in the sun. This is a good one. Okay, Ruben, you explain to, to him what what you've heard about these glasses. Well, um, they're black, so they kind of like attract sun. And um, I'm not sure how, but somehow, if you leave them out in the sun too long, they explode. <laughs> <laughs> <Ow>. <laughs> No, no, that's not how they work. It's actually pretty wonderful. So the the explanation for how the the 3D glasses work is actually pretty neat. Um, do you know how you can tell the how, how they give the illusion of three dimensions? Is that yes, you've got these two eyes, right? And each eye sees a slightly different picture. If you close one eye and then close the other eye and go back and forth. The picture shifts, right? <laughs> Your two eyes see slightly different images, and the differences between the images they see change depending on how far an object is away from you. So right now I'm looking outside a window, and if I close my left eye and right eye back and forth, the window jumps back and forth, but the image far away from me hardly changes at all. And so my brain puts that information together and tells me how far things are away from me, and that's how I see in three dimensions. Um, have you ever seen 1950s type 3D glasses where one, no. one is red and the other is blue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. So that's the same thing. What happens is one of the lenses lets blue a light through and the other lets red light through. And then on these old time movie screens, they would project two images, one that was red and the other that was blue. And so, you know, if there was something really close to the person that they wanted to pop out of the screen, they would make those two pictures really, really different. And then if something was far away from the person watching the movie, far deep in the screen, they'd make the pictures almost the same. And because your two lenses would filter, one would only see the blue color one, one would only see the red color one, because they're filtering like that, your brain puts the information together and sees a three-dimensional picture. And the way they work in modern movie theaters isn't that different, but they let you use color now instead of just red and blue. And the way they do that is fantastic. It has to do with one of the basic properties of light. So we've been talking about how light is a wave, and the deal is that it has, it's a crazy word called polarization. In essence, it's kind of like, give me a a name of your friend. Zachary. Hey, Zachary, how's it going? Okay, so imagine Zachary goes to jail, right? So you and Zachary (laughs) robbed a bank. Zachary's in jail, uh, but he didn't didn't tell the cops on you. And so you want to hang out with your buddy in jail. So you're going to play Frisbee with your friend. Okay, so the deal is you want to throw the frisbee to Zachary, who's on the other side of these bars. Now, if you throw the frisbee in a way that it passes between the bars, it can make it through. But if you if you don't line up the frisbee's orientation quite right, it'll end up bumping into the bars. So two frisbees might be moving in the same direction, but one will be able to pass through the bars because it will be oriented up down, and the other won't because it will be oriented left right. So light does the same thing; it has this orientation to it as well, and so. 
when you go to a movie theater, you have these two lenses. They're called polarizing filters. But in essence, they're just like jail bars. One of them goes left, right. The other goes up, down. And then the light that comes from the screen, the light that's oriented left, right, can pass through one of the lenses. And then the other lens will only let up, down light through it. Yeah. And so you can mm-hmm. end up seeing two different images that are both in color, and that's how these things work. So it's just this very simple filter. So, Steve, do you have a pair of polarized sunglasses? Yeah, I do. Uh, well, I, I used to, actually. They, I've lost them. Okay. Well, but not on me right now. It's the same technology, polarized filters. And, and there's something fun you can do. If you go to one of these movies and you steal the glasses, I know you're supposed to give the glasses back, and I don't endorse stealing or robbing banks. But if somehow you forget to hand in your glasses after the show... There's a fun trick you can play with them. If you have two of these polarized lenses, if you, say, break your glasses in half, if you look through one, so you hold one of the sides up to your right eye, and look at the other one, the other one will get light or dark depending on how you rotate it. Because the one in your hand, not the one up to your eye, will only let light through that's oriented in a certain way. And if it's oriented in a different way, like the one that you're holding up to your face, if they line up, then it will look clear. And if it doesn't line up, it will look black. And so you can actually rotate it around like that. And it's amazing. Here's what I'm getting at. Light that comes from Rayleigh scattering is polarized. It all It's all up-down light. And so if you have one of these polarizing filters that you took out of a movie theater, and you go and look up at the blue sky with it, if you rotate the lens around, the sky light will get dark or bright depending on how you're rotating it. That's awesome. Oh, it's so awesome. Have you done it? Oh, yeah. It's fun. Well, that was lots of fun. So thank you, Ken. Thank you, Amanda. You've pleased me. Your efforts are born fruit. That fruit is sweet. Here is some fruit. Amanda, you get a blueberry. Yep. Nom, nom, nom. I'd like to thank my guest, Steve Van Breda, and his son, Ruben. Thanks, Steve and Ruben. I hope you had lots of fun. Yeah, we had a great time. Uh-huh. It was lots of fun. Cool. Let's talk, you and me, TIE fighters. Listen, I love the show, and I hope you do, too. But for every listener to the show, I know that there's a hundred other people who would love to listen, but they don't know how. So I want you to spread the word about our show. There are three ways you can do this. First, there's iTunes. iTunes is still the biggest place where people go to find new podcasts. And iTunes puts the shows with the most ratings at the front where everybody can see them. So if you've got a minute, give us an iTunes review. It'll increase our rank and more people end up seeing us. The second is to teach people how to listen to podcasts. I know this sounds foolish, but everybody has a smartphone or a tablet these days, and a very low percentage of these people actually know how to listen to podcasts. They don't know how much fun they could be having. So if somebody you know who might like the show doesn't listen to podcasts, ask them about it. And if they're sure enough they don't know how to listen, point them to the Stitcher app, because it's free and easy to use, and it works on almost every handheld device. And surely your grandmother will thank you for the good advice. So the third way to spread the word about our show is to tell people online about us. The internet is full of explanations about physics. If you see somebody on the internet talking about a topic one of our episodes covers, post a comment telling us about the show. Oh, well, that's it. I hope you'll help us out and point new listeners in our direction. So thanks. Anyway, that's it for the main part of the today's show. Remember, if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, you might also want to hear... Other shows on the Brachial Media Network, like the weekly Wienersmith with Kelly and Zach Wienersmith, where they talk to academics about research, or Science Sort Of, where we talk about science in the news and also explain science and talk about beer. Editing for the Titanium Physicist podcast is provided by a gentleman gentleman named John Heath. Thanks, John. So the intro to our show is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists, and the end song is by John Vanderslice. Until next time, my friends, remember to keep science in your hearts. to tell you dear before you come back here I lost I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage he was eating spring mix on the carpet jumped through a window out into the haze hop down magnolia boulevard no
would there be any animals on Earth that have differently evolved eyes than ours that would see the sky as a different color? Well, I don't know if it would see it as a different color. That's a good question. Mm. They do have different sensitivities in what they can see. So they don't have the same, like we have uh, different rods and cones in our eyes that cause us to be sensitive or less sensitive to different colors of light. Mm -hmm. And so animals have different sensitivities and different numbers of receptors of rods and cones. So that allows them to see a whole different spectrum or more detailed colors than we can see. Mm -hmm. But I think some of them are more sensitive towards the infrared, like things that can see at night. Night vision comes because you have more sensitivity to the longer wavelengths. Okay. Um, but I don't, I don't think that that would cause animals to see a different color of sky. That's an interesting question. I hadn't thought of that. Okay, cool. Rayleigh, R E I. How do you spell Rayleigh? R A Y L E I T H. <laughs> what? No, it's it's got an E in there. Yeah. R A Y L E I G H. Okay. There's an E. I promise. All right. Well, I'm, Google's too slow to tell me whether or not you're right. We'll go with that. <laughs> I concur. He's right. <laughs> okay, so it's called Rayleigh scattering. It's named after an old British guy. I just told you that. I'm going to edit me saying this again out. Hey, Ruben, what's your favorite Pokemon? Um, kind of hard. Um... Snorlax? Oh, yeah. Why do you like Snorlax? I don't know. I think he's just kind of cool. Like, he sleeps a lot. Yeah, I like, I like that. that about Snorlax. <laughs> he eats a lot. Hey, come back. Okay. And I have heard actually an, an neat, another neat uh, application for the 3D TVs. When you're playing against a buddy, uh, on a, like a first person shooter, yep. you can have the glasses so that one guy is looking at his own screen and it's polarized. So the other guy is wearing different glasses and he's, he's looking at, at a, the same screen but a completely different image. Oh, really? So, because the, the screen is constantly showing both, like, if it was doing a 3D movie, it would be showing constantly two separate images right. from a different, but now it's just showing two completely different screens. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Now, I, I, th this might be like a, like, a, you know, an experimental, some guy, you know, people exp uh, experimenting in the basement, but it, you know, you can't cheat by looking at your buddies and like, oh, he's in the tower. Cause I yes, see true. <laughs> well, you can always lift up your glasses and. Wait, no. You could always turn your close one eye and turn your glasses sideways. <laughs> True, I guess you could, yeah. I guess it's easy to tell when someone's cheating that way, though. <laughs> Dude, no! So, uh, do you have any other questions, Ruben, or Steve? Um, Amanda, yep. um, right now in science, we're learning about space. Yeah. And, and so, um, I'm watching this video, it's called, um... To the planets and beyond. It's about yeah. like, um, like around. I think it's eight people. And they're in space for um, six years, and they're visiting all of these planets. I really think you would like it. Wow, that's I think it's great. A BB, it's a BBC production, I think, and it oh, teaches okay. about the planets by having a, a narrative of different uh, astronauts visiting different planets. And what I really like about it is that. They put it into a. They make it into a story, and they, they there's two episodes to it. I'm pretty sure, and it, it's just like people going on planets, and um, just doing all the ex these experiments. And I think it's really cool. So, do they ever talk about what the sunset looks like or what the sky looks like on those planets? No, but um, they do talk about the sun having a magnetic field. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so they, according to, if they want to go to this one planet, they have to go through, go really close to the sun. So if they want to go that close to the sun, the sun has a magnetic field. And so they're going to have to make their own magnetic fields. Oh. That's, that's right. Will yeah. you tell me what it's called again? To the planets and beyond. Oh, great. Thanks. You're welcome. Excellent. Um, 
Okay, Ben, um, I listened to your uh, your other podcast about uh, gravity and time distortion. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so I wrote this question down shortly after I, <laughs> I listened to it. And, and I'm, I, I hope I remember enough about it to, to, to make sense. But so this is the question I wrote down. Um, if time experienced on Earth is used as a control reference point, is there any theory that might allow for time to move faster for the, uh, faster for the twin that leaves? So like one year on Earth uh, for one twin might equal 10 years for the twin that, that leaves. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do that. In fact, uh, time... Uh, time, have we done the show yet? Yes, we have. Okay, so time on the surface of the Earth passes slower than when you're out in orbit because we're sitting on a gra- in, inside a gravitational well. Mm-hmm. So presumably, if you had a twin who, you know, went out to the edge of the solar system and just kind of hovered around for a couple thousand years, he'd come back and his twin would be or older yeah. than him. And, but would there be like you know with the with the black holes? It, it's a very very um, dramatic difference. Oh yeah, you know yeah. But is there any 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 object or theory about an object that would be like an an anti black hole that would that would accelerate that process? Okay, so there's something called a white hole. Um, okay, and sure enough, uh, when you get close to a white hole, let's see, you'd still be accelerating. I need to check the math on what yeah. uh, gravity's full of these tricky things where it works. You, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. But there is something <laughs> called a, a white hole, and it it blows instead of sucking, um, and it only exists on paper. Okay, it, yeah. It's essentially what you get if you take a black hole and you flip it upside down or reverse it in time. <laughs> so uh, times it by negative one. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so you flip time backwards and you get a white hole. I think that in that case, though, if you stood near a white hole for a long time, time would slow down. Time doesn't speed up when you get really close to white holes, I don't think. All right. Uh, it was just when I was listening to the podcast, I was thinking, oh, well, we have that. Yeah, it's fun. The, but can we? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. No, this, this has been pretty awesome. 